Hi everyone and welcome back. In our last lesson we introduced a brand new result called the component test which allows us to decide very efficiently whether or not a given vector field is conservative. We applied this result at the end of the lesson to show that this vector field f of x y equals 3x squared y minus 1 x cubed minus 2 y is indeed conservative and there are several important pieces of information that come from this. Firstly, from the definition itself, we know that since f is conservative, it can be written as the gradient of little f for some scalar function little f. Well, that's kind of cool. We also know that capital F is path independent. So maybe if I had asked you as a follow-up to evaluate some crazy line integral of this vector field, well, you could say, I'm not going to use this path, Zach. I'm going to use this much simpler path. You can do that because you know that your vector field is conservative and therefore path independent. Of course, if you wanted to actually evaluate those line integrals, you would still have to go by definition, right? You'd have to parametrize your curve, plug the parametrization into f, take the dot product with the derivative. You know the drill. But I know what you're thinking. Zach, doesn't the fundamental theorem of line integrals apply? Why don't we just use that? Well, you're right, it does apply when you know that your vector field is conservative. But how are you going to use this result if you don't yet know this potential function? Until we know little f, we're going to have to stick with the definition. So the purpose of this video is to figure out how do we determine this little f once we know our vector field is conservative. Okay, I'm going to use the example from the last slide to show you how to find this potential function f once we know it exists. There are no major tricks here, but there is a short process that you can follow. Since we know that this vector field is equal to the gradient of some little f, we can write it as partial f by partial x, partial f by partial y. So we know the partial derivatives of the function we're looking for. The partial derivative with respect to x is 3x squared y minus 1, and the partial derivative of f with respect to y is x cubed minus 2y. So the first step in our process is to undo one of these partial derivatives. That is, we're either going to anti-differentiate this one with respect to x or anti-differentiate this one with respect to y. The one you choose doesn't really matter. I usually start with the one that looks easier, but in this example they look about the same in difficulty. So why don't we just start with the first one. Our first job is to anti-differentiate and we're choosing partial f over partial x which is 3x squared y minus 1. Okay, when I anti-differentiate with respect to x, well, I'm going to undo the derivative on the left side, so I'm simply left with f of xy. When I anti-differentiate on the right side, I have the integral of 3x squared y minus 1 dx, and now you can see that an antiderivative here is going to be x cubed y minus x. But hold on a second. This antiderivative doesn't have bounds, right? It's not a definite integral. It's a general antiderivative. When you calculated these back in Calc 2, didn't you usually include a plus c at the end, plus a constant? Oh yeah, that's because constants would disappear if I took a derivative. Hmm, but now we're dealing with partial derivatives. We're dealing with a partial derivative with respect to x. So it's not just constants that are going to disappear. Really, any expression that depends just on y would disappear. So instead of adding plus c to the end of my antiderivative, I'm going to add plus g of y. This could represent literally any function involving just y. At this stage, we're about halfway through the problem. We've identified the general form of our function f of x, y, but we still don't know what this mysterious g of y term is. Of course, we have only used half of our information. We haven't said anything about the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression for f and I'm going to differentiate it. I'm going to calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to y starting from what I have here. And I'm going to compare that to what I should get from the question. So partial f by partial y, I could compute it one way by taking the partial with respect to y of x cubed y minus x plus g of y, this expression you see here. That derivative is x cubed, the minus x goes away, and I have g prime y at the end. Now that's supposed to be equal to x cubed minus 2y. 
So x cubed plus g prime y is equal to x cubed minus 2y. Magically, the x cubes cancel out, and we find that g prime y is minus 2y. Now just undo that last derivative, and you'll find that g of y, this mystery function that we were looking for, is really minus y squared. Of course, we could add plus a constant at this point, right? We could have plus c, but there's no need. When we use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, much like when we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, that plus c term is just gonna disappear. It's gonna get canceled out. So I'm just gonna take my constant to be zero. My function is x cubed y minus x minus y squared. Let's try an example where we put it all together. Here I've given you a vector field f that looks kind of complicated, and I'm asking you to evaluate a certain line integral of f. Here, we're integrating over the arc of the curve y equals sine x from 0, 0 to pi 0. Okay, uh, well, y equals sine x is going to look something like this. Here's 0, 0, here's pi 0, and I guess we're integrating over this path here. Hmm, parametrizing that path wouldn't be too hard, right? I could write x equals t and y equals sine t with t between 0 and pi. But if I go by definition to evaluate this line integral, if I use the definition of my line integral, then I'm going to have to put that parametrization in here and then take some horrible integral, and I'd really prefer not to do that. So if I can avoid it, I will. Instead of using the definition, I'm going to try to find a potential function for this guy. I'm going to try to show it's conservative, find a potential function, and use the fundamental theorem. Much, much easier. So before I even start my lengthy process of finding a potential, I'm going to make sure that a potential exists. I'm going to call this first component P and the second component Q, and I'm going to apply my component test. I compute the partial derivative of P with respect to Y, and that's simply e to the Y minus 2X. Next, I compute the partial derivative of Q with respect to X. I get e to the Y minus 2X. Oh, that sounds familiar. That's exactly what we got here. So my derivatives agree, and after a quick check, I see that the domain of my vector field is all of R2, right? There's no point where I could be dividing by zero or taking the square root of a negative. My domain is R2, it's simply connected. Since my partial derivatives agree and my domain is simply connected, the component test says F is conservative. We should be able to find a potential function. Okay, we're gonna carry out the same process as in the last example to find our potential function, little f. We know that the partial derivative of little f with respect to x is gonna be e to the y minus 2xy. We also know that the partial derivative of little f with respect to y is gonna be x e to the y minus x squared. We start by undoing one of these expressions with an antiderivative. Again, it doesn't really matter which one, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first one. So since partial f by partial x is e to the y minus 2xy, we have that f of xy is equal to the integral of e to the y minus 2xy dx, right? I'm going to find the antiderivative. Well, the antiderivative of e to the y with respect to x is x e to the y, and the antiderivative of 2xy with respect to x is x squared y, so I have e to the y minus x squared y plus some function of y plus g of y. If you had started with the other expression, you would have added some function of x. Next, we're going to tie this into our other partial derivative. We have that the partial derivative of f with respect to y can be computed as the partial with respect to y of x e to the y minus x squared y plus g of y, using this expression here. And this gives us x e to the y minus x squared plus g prime y. That's the partial with respect to y that we get when we start with the expression on the last line. Okay, time to compare. We've calculated the partial with respect to y one way, but we know that it's going to have to match up with the partial with respect to y given in the question. So x e to the y minus x squared plus g prime y is going to have to be equal to x e to the y minus x squared. Ah, what do you know? 
everything cancels out except for g prime y. We find that g prime y is zero and therefore g of y is a constant. g of y equals to some c. But as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, that constant is going to get destroyed when we use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, right? The plus c goes away. So we could pick the constant to be whatever we want. And I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to say g of y is zero. So my potential function is f of x, y equals x e to the y minus x squared y. Okay, everyone, behold the power of the fundamental theorem. We are looking for the line integral of f along this curve c, the curve y equals sine x from 0, 0 to pi 0. Well, we just went through all this trouble of finding a potential function, little f, so let's use it. To find the line integral along c of f dot dr, I'm going to replace big F with the gradient of little f. So I have the integral along c of nabla f dot dr, and according to our fundamental theorem, this is simply f at the terminal point, f at pi 0, minus f at the initial point, f at 0, 0, and I'll let you check just by plugging these points in that you get a final answer of pi. 